the, the second part of the session, um, study design and interpretation, the reproducibility crisis. And um, this is, uh, we're entering the hands-on um, part of the um, uh, webinar. Um, so this is gonna be led by um, Pierre Levant, uh, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Radiology at the University of Calgary. His research consists of the development of MRI methods to investigate brain function, and he develops new data acquisition and processing technologies to characterize the healthy and diseased brain, particularly in the context of neurological disorders such as epilepsy and stroke. And um, today he'll be giving a hands-on session titled A White Hat's Guide to P-Hacking. So I'm looking forward to hearing all about that um, since I'm not familiar with what some of those words mean. Um, and Pierre, you should be able to just share your screen, hopefully. Okay, so let me try that. While you get that set up here, uh, are you happy to have people enter interrupt you while you're going through this if they have questions? Uh, yeah, I think that should be fine. I mean, uh, with, with these kinds of virtual sessions, it's always hard to make it interactive. So um, I'm not sure there will be uh, any interruptions, but if there, uh, if people uh, feel like they would like to, uh, they are certainly welcome to. Great, thank you. Okay, so I guess I can get started. Um, yeah, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, yeah p hacking because we've heard a lot in the previous talks as well uh, during this session how um, you have all these these p values and how they are unreliable and everything and the idea behind this talk uh, is to yeah give you some some demonstration of um, what people mean by yeah they're unreliable they can be easily manipulated. So uh, yeah, to start with, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So uh, as we've seen as well in some of the previous, uh, from the previous speakers, um, we live in a world where there's an unfortunate yet sometimes necessary uh, obsession with p-values. It seems that p-values represent everything. They represent the ground truth. Um, everything we do is dictated by whether this p-value is less or above 0.05. Um, and this is just, yeah, an example of two data sets. Um, the sample size is really small, yeah, just 12. I, I like to, for, for these kinds of presentations, I like to work with small sample sizes because it makes it easier to, to visualize the data and to visualize individual data points. Um, but on the left side, uh, you can see an example, you know, you're analyzing your data, you're correlating two variables, X and Y. Um, you as I said, you have 12, 12 data points and you're just trying to figure out whether there's a correlation between them. And then lo and behold, you do, you get a correlation of 0.58 and a p-value of 0.048. So you're really happy. You're going to not, maybe not even show that plot in your paper. You're just going to report, yeah, we found a strong correlation between X and Y. My correlation coefficient is 0.58. My p is less than 0.05. And then that's going to be a conclusion of your paper. But, um, you know, it could have well as well have been that uh, you have slightly different data and uh, you've gotten something like the plot on the right, where, you know, same amount of data points. Uh, this time you, go, you get a correlation of 0 0.57, so just slightly below um, the previous one. And uh, unfortunately, your p-value of 0 0.051, not significant. Uh, you might not even show that plot again. You're just going to conclude there's no correlation between X and Y because my p-value is more than 0.05. So um, yeah, but in fact, if you look at those two data sets, they're pretty much the same. I mean, it's different data, but they represent the same conclusion. I mean, you have a correlation that's apparently strong, yeah, 0 0.58, that, that's pretty good. Um, the p-value is almost the same, of course, um, but you will reach completely different conclusions, even though those two data sets basically show the same thing. And uh, if you're a bit more, um, if you dig a bit deeper into that, you'll see that actually what those two data sets say is uh, unfortunately not that much uh, because of the low sample size. Or here are two um, other examples. Uh, on one side, you, got, you get a low sample size, uh, but high correlation value, 0 0.58. It's the same example as the previous slide. You get a significant p-value, yeah, 0 0.048. 
Well, on the right side, you decided to run another study, maybe studying the same question. You're correlating the two variables, but this time you decide to acquire more data. You acquired 100 data points. Um, and here you get a correlation of 0 0.2. And uh, again, a p-value pretty much similar to the other one, uh, 0 0.045. And then you're asking yourself, well, which of the, of the two sides provide the, more, the most evidence that there is an effect between X and Y. And unfortunately, what we often see in papers is people will say, well, it's the left, the, the left side because the correlation is so strong, yeah, 0 0.58. Well, on the right side, even though I have more data, well, it's a weak correlation, doesn't mean anything, maybe. Um, and in fact, the significance of those two data sets is, is exactly the same. And of course, uh, this is also something we've heard before. Um, correlation values and p-values alone don't tell you that much. Um, what you really need are confidence intervals that tell you, yeah, what the um, what what the true effect or what the true correlation um, could be. So this is just a few examples. I think you've seen not only in the previous talks, but in all the pre, also all all across this conference, uh, examples like this that you might have very wide confidence intervals on on your correlation coefficient in this case. Um, in which case, yeah, this is they they all overlap zero, so they're statistically non significant, but they're still potentially clinically relevant, right? Because even though they're not significant, the correlation could the true correlation could lie anywhere on this confidence interval. So it could be really high, it could be 0 0.5, it could be uh, close to one. Uh, or here, you know, there's almost no difference between uh, those two confidence intervals, but just because it doesn't overlap zero, then suddenly this becomes statistically significant. Now, maybe if you have a little more data, you can really narrow those confidence intervals um, and find something like this, where you see, okay, my confidence intervals are really narrow, but in fact, my correlation values are not that high. So even though, for example, in the example here, um, I have something that's statistically significant, well, maybe it's not clinically relevant. And what we should really be aiming for is more the last case here, where you have something that's both statistically significant and clinically relevant. But you can really only see this if you, if you plot not only the correlation values, the p-values, but also um, the confidence intervals. So it's clear from my demonstration here, but also from the previous talks, that p-values don't tell the whole story. Uh, it's preferable to show the data and the confidence intervals. So if I go back to my example here, where I only have 12 data points, but I still manage to find a correlation of 0 0.59, you know, pretty strong for, you know, depend on, depending on what you're studying, uh, it's a significant p-value, 0 0.04. But then if I actually um, report the confidence interval of this correlation value, uh, I see that even though it's 0 0.59, it could, the true value could lie anywhere between 0 0.02 and 0 0.87 in this case, which basically means that I know nothing about my confidence interval. It could lie anywhere, it could be close to zero, it could be close to one. Uh, I actually have no idea. So p-values are bad, uh, they don't tell the whole story, but of course we still recognize that it is sometimes necessary um, to make this kind of binary decision. Yeah, is a given hypothesis true or not? Sometimes you, you need to do that. You know, some, for example, when you approve a drug or whether you wanna propose you know, a new MRI sequence and you wanna show that you know, it's worth doing it, you know, should, should you include it in your protocol or not? So, even though p-values don't tell the story, you need a criteria. And we've been settled on saying, yeah, p-value 0.05, it's not ideal, but we still use it because it's an objective, even if it's arbitrary, it's an objective decision threshold. If it's above that, then it's not significant. If it's below, it is, and that can influence your decision. Fortunately, for us researchers, um, this leads to frustration. When you invested a lot of time, a lot of grant money um, to run a study, and then you end up with a P that's yeah, marginally non-significant. You know, you run this correlation and you find, ah, oh, my P is 0 0.054. How unfortunate, you know, I've invested so much time, I'm trying to do, you know, a PhD, and now this is just wasted time because in the end it's not significant, no one will let me publish this. And yet this could still be an interesting result, right? Because um, the probability to observe such a correlation by chance 
is still only 5.4%. So even though it's above the 5% threshold, um, it could still be a very interesting result. So because we rely so much on this kind of threshold, we might miss you know, interesting results that are you know, just above threshold. And this is where p-hacking come in. You're trying to do something to justify all the time and grant money that you've invested in the study. So if your p-value is slightly above 0 0.05 and you still want to publish your study, um, yeah, why not p-hack? Everyone does it. You're missing out if you don't. Um, and even if you don't think you're doing it, well, you're probably doing it maybe unintention unintentionally or unknowingly. Now, before I, I go a bit further, um, before you think that I actually endorse p-hacking, um, this is kind of meant as a demonstration of what can go wrong, what can go, uh, what, what everybody is doing so that you can get better at also spotting when, when this actually happens. Because of course, uh, it's not the correct thing to do. But um, the idea here is, uh, of this talk is to provide a tutorial of what you could do if you had bad intentions. So the basic of, of p-hacking is um, this idea of multiple comparisons. You know, everybody knows, right? If you do a lot of statistical tests, um, you increase your chance of finding a false positive, even though you might test one hypothesis at a level of 0.05. So you only have a 5% chance of finding a false positive if, if there is no um, true effect. But if you start testing more and more and more hypotheses, let's say 100 hypotheses, then you actually have a 90% chance of finding a false positive along the way. Um, and you will, of course, all know that uh, what you should do to try to solve this is, you know, Bonferroni correction. So if instead of testing at a 0.05 level, you test at a 0.05 divided by 100, then suddenly after testing 100 hypotheses, um, you get this desired significance level of 0.05. But you, know, you don't wanna do that. You wanna p-hack. You, you wanna find some, some false positives to be able to publish your data. And you wanna convince people that, that they're not false positives. So um, to do this, um, the idea of this session or is to provide some sort of um, yeah, hands-on way of how, how you could do this. So um, we're gonna do a demonstration in R. Um, if you don't know R, don't worry. Um, I'm, you can just follow along um, as I do it. Uh, but just for information, basically everything is, all the code is available in this GitHub uh, repository. So my name slash uh, MRI together. And uh, then you can either play with the code, you can do what you want, or you can just run it as is, uh, which is what I'm going to do now. So let's exit the presentation and go in there. So um, in this repository, which I've opened here in our studio, so there's like a few examples and then we'll see whether um, we have enough time to, to go through all of them. But uh, it's just to demonstrate a bit uh, how you can get significant results from non-significant data. So let's see, uh, let's make this bigger. So what we're gonna start with is when we're going to generate some yeah, random uncorrelated data. So we're just gonna generate some noise. There shouldn't be any uh, relationship uh, between you know, all the variables we're generating. You know, we're just generating noise and this is what we're gonna do here. So um, you know, just to make this uh, demonstration reproducible, that's why I'm setting a, um, a seed for my randomizer when I don't know which seed to select, I select 42. So let's run just this part of the code and then, oh, actually I just generated two random data, two random noisy variables that have no relationship with each other. Uh, I correlate them and lo and behold, I find a correlation of 0 0.44, um, which is unfortunately for me, the researcher who's trying to get um, significant results, right? Um, not significant. So I get a p-value of 0 0.054. Now, this is just with 20, um, maybe I scan 20 subjects. I mean, these are just 20 data points. So admittedly, it's a small sample size, but 20 is actually not um, that different from what you find in you know, typical MRI literature, right? 
So unfortunately, it's not significant. Well, what can you do if you really want it to be significant? Well, as we just mentioned, the more experiments you run, uh, and this is part of this, of this whole reproducibility thing, um, the more likely that you're going to get a significant result along the way. So uh, this is also this idea of why most published research um, studies are false, is that you might have you know, 20 laboratories doing the same experiment uh, with the same analysis. And just by chance, because you're using a p-value of 0.05, uh, one of those 20 labs will get a significant result. So if you have enough money, uh, you could just run the experiment 20 times, and then eventually you're going to find something significant, even if there's yeah nothing to see there. So um, you can just try it. Um, let's Let's see. Basically, I'm just running the code again. I'm generating again uh, uncorrelated data, and uh, I'm going to correlate the variables and see where, what I'm going to get. So let's run this a second time. OK, I get a correlation of 0.33, p-value of 0.15, not significant. Yeah, keep going. Next experiment, next, next. Huh. I actually get a negative correlation, and it's significant. But that's not what I want. So I'm going to keep acquiring more data. Yeah, very nice, very nice. Not significant, not significant. I might start getting frustrated, but then, ha, huh, there you go. After 11 experiments, I've managed to get the positive correlation that I wanted. It's uh, statistically significant, so I can stop there. I can discard my first 10 experiments, uh, just pretend I never did them, and just publish experiment number 11, uh, because it's, it's significant. And in fact, um, this is what happens, maybe not within the same lab, but maybe across labs, that you know, 11 labs might run an experiment and only the one who found something significant um, gets published. And then we think that this is the truth. So this is an obvious result, right? Uh, this is just you know, the pure demonstration of the multiple comparison problem. Um, What's interesting to see is, you know, as you run your experiments, how do your p-values change? I mean, we see they move all over the place. Sometimes, most of the time, they were not significant. And then suddenly at experiment number 11, I found something that is significant. So let's run this instead of just running it, you know, one at a time, 11 times, let's run it a thousand times. I'm gonna run it 1,000 times the same experiments here in R. So I'm gonna do this, and this is how the p-values change over time. So they get all over the place. Uh, in some of my experiments, they are significant. They are, they, they are here plotted in red. Uh, you get p-values that are less than 0.05. Sometimes you get p-values that are really high. Uh, it just seemed to vary pretty uni uniformly. And this is actually exactly what's supposed to happen. P-values, um, when the null hypothesis is true, um, are actually uniformly distributed. So this is the results of my thousand experiments. This is how my p-values look like. And exactly as you would expect, around 5% of my p-values are significant. So nothing surprising there. What happens if there is actually correlation in my data? So up to now, I've only shown what happens when the variables are completely random. And in fact, it's quite the beauty of it when, I, when you think about it, that um, you, know, you might say, I don't want to have to repeat my experiment 20 times or 100 times until I get a significant result, where you actually don't need to repeat your experiment 20 times, because this was just noise, this was just garbage. So you can just you know, run the scanner with no one in it, you're going to get, it's, it's going to be cheaper, it's not going to cost you anything, and you're going to get significant results at some point. Now, let's say that there is um, a true correlation in your data. So again, here I'm generating data that has um, correlation in it. So um, yeah, it's again only 20 data points or so. Um, here there's a clear correlation. And if I run also the, the, the test on the correlation, I find that the correlation coefficient is 0.67, p-value 0.001. So that's highly significant. But I can do the same thing, repeat the experiment multiple times and see what is actually happening to my p-values as I repeat this a thousand times. And 
I see that many of my experiments will, in this case, they will be significant because there is a true correlation in my data, but not all of them. The p-values will still jump all over the place. Um, and that's actually the, um, the idea of p-value. It's, it's, it, the, that, that's the point of randomness that um, sometimes you're not gonna get the results you want, even if there is a true correlation in your data. And again, I can do the same thing as before and plot the distribution of p-values. And yeah, it's true that most of my p-values are significant, but actually only about half of them. Um, so this is data that has a true correlation. I'm trying to test whether the correlation is significant in an experimental setting. And I find that, yeah, only 50% of the time will I be successful. So this is an example of, you know, a study that might be underpowered, right? There's only a 50% chance of detecting this effect. So this particular example is just to show how um, just repeating experiments multiple times can lead to false positives. I think this is something that is clear to most people, but um, I, I just, if you want, if you want to play with the code, uh, there's the opportunity to do it. But of course, yeah, maybe not that spectacular because it, it should be fairly obvious. So let's move on to the next example, whoops, which is something that happens uh, maybe even more often. So I'm again going to generate random uncorrelated data. And uh, even though it's pure noise, uh, just by chance, I got a correlation value that is, you know, marginally non-significant. Yeah, my p-value is 0 0.054. Now, again, I'm quite frustrated um, because I would really like my correlation to be significant, right? So I can, I can publish this data. So what are you gonna do? Well, how about acquiring more subjects? That's often what happens, right? You say, oh, I acquired 20 subjects. I'm, I'm almost significant, but not quite. And, you know, I, I should just acquire yeah, a couple more subjects and then my p-value will become significant and, and, and I can publish it. So let's do it. We're gonna extend this random data by adding you know, one more data point. Uh, and in fact, this is again, a complete garbage data point. We're just adding noise um, to these 20 subjects and see what happens. So instead of 20 subjects, I will now have, um, yeah, 21. So sorry, this says uh, this still says 20, but now I've added one. So there's actually 21 subjects now. Uh, and this is the new data point that was added, right? If you compare it to the previous plot, um, there's just like one, one extra data point that was added. And then the nice thing is that suddenly my correlation becomes significant. My p-value has become 0 0.048 just by virtue of adding a random noisy data point. So I can totally manipulate my data and say, okay, I had something that was not significant. I just added one random garbage point and then I got a significant result. I can publish it. And if no one questions that, well, I maybe get, a, I don't know, a nice paper out of it. So, of course, this is just one example. Uh, it could have gone in the other direction too, right? Because I've just added noise, uh, it could have been that my correlation became even less significant. So let's see how often that actually happens. So I'm going to try adding an extra data points, yeah, a hundred times and see what happens to um, my p-value. So when I do that, it turns out that, you know, I do this a hundred times. So sometimes the p-value that was close to significant becomes highly non-significant, which is maybe what you could intuitively expect. But many times you actually find that my p-values get more significant just by adding this random data point. And in fact, exactly half of my attempts to add an extra data point have resulted in my correlation becoming significant. And this is due to a kind of misconception. Um, you think that if you have a result that is yeah, maybe marginally non-significant, but you still think that underlying that there is a true effect, there is a true correlation, 
then you would think that adding more subjects, adding more data will cause p-values to get smaller and smaller, right? You're adding more evidence and therefore adding more subjects will confirm your theory. While if the null hypothesis is true, if there is no correlation, no true effect, adding more and more data should cause your p-values to get less and less significant. But actually this is not true. This is a misconception and I can prove it. So let's try again to generate data. Um, this is data that has a true correlation between them, right? Uh, I generate the variable y that depends on x. And this time I'm going to, um, let's see, plot it. So this is a weak correlation, right? But because I have a, you know, 1,500 data points, uh, even though the correlation is weak, you know, it's highly significant, right? So there is a true relationship uh, between X and Y. Now I'm going to simulate, you know, starting with just 20 of those data points and gradually adding one data point at a time amongst those 1,500 ones and see how my p-value evolves. And let's plot how my p-values work as I add more and more data. So this is kind of what you would expect, right? It makes sense. There is a true relationship between X and Y. There is a true correlation. So as you add more and more data, at the beginning when the data, when you don't have so many data points, I get a P that's maybe not very significant. I get, I, I don't, I'm not able to detect the correlation between X and Y. But as I add more and more data, you know, as I have a thousand data points, a thousand five hundred data points, and suddenly I'm highly significant. But what might be surprising is that it's not a smooth ride along the way. Um, yeah, starting at around maybe a hundred data points, as I add more and more data, my p-values do indeed go down. And at some point it becomes significant. But after a while, even though there is, you know, I, I need to remind you again, there is a true relationship between X and Y. There is a true effect. Adding more data actually causes my p-value to become non-significant again. And then adding more and more data suddenly causes it to, to become more significant. And if I kept going, um, actually you would see that it, it, it doesn't stay this kind of monotonic de decrease in the p-value. It will again cross up again at some point in the future and cross down again. And of course there will be more and more data points that are significant as I add more data, right? I have, I have more evidence that there is this true correlation, but it, it will not be smooth. It will oscillate. That's, there will be some cases where you add some data and then suddenly it stops being significant again. And that's just the nature of randomness. And maybe even more surprising, uh, let's see what happens when you do this with data that has no correlation between them. So I have my two variables, X and Y, they're completely random, no correlation between them. And uh, yeah, you can see it here. If I have all those data points, I get a correlation of very close to zero, a p-value that's totally non-significant. And now let's simulate again the same thing. I start with 20 data points. I do my correlation. I um, plot the p-value and then I start adding one data point at a time and see what happens to my p-values. Oh, well, as I start with 20, uh, it, I was non-significant. Then I added a couple more and then suddenly I was significant. Then I added some more data. I stopped being significant again. And then strangely, even though again, this is pure noise that I'm adding. After a while, whoa, it's as I add more data, it's my p-value become less than 0.05. I'm suddenly significant. And it's, I stay significant for quite a while. From about 100 to 500 data points, it seems that I can detect a significant correlation between these two noisy variables that have nothing to do with each other. And then as I add more data, suddenly it gets, less, it's, it gets non-significant, it starts oscillating. And again, if I kept going forever, at some point in the future, it will cross back again to the level of significance and non-significance. And I can get basically anything I want. And the reason for that is that p-values are, yeah, a random variable. They can be anything. And 
by adding more and more data, what you do is kind of a random walk of those p-values. And if you know anything about random walks, uh, you know that you will basically visit the entire possible range of p-values eventually. So even though my data has nothing to do with each other, the variables are random, uncorrelated, uh, I just need to keep going for long enough and I will find regions uh, where my data appears to show a correlation. So it turns out this is just a variation of the same theme as before, um, that if you run enough experiments, if you repeat enough experiments, just because of this multiple comparisons problem, you will find significant results at some point. Um, and unfortunately, this seems, yeah, maybe trivial, but this happens all the time. Um, you know, you've seen, I've seen so many animal experiments, especially where the ethics committee say, okay, you want to scan, you know, a hundred rats in your MRI and, you know, you're going to have to sacrifice them after. And this is just not nice for the poor animals. So instead of scanning a hundred rats, why don't you scan them in batches of 20? And then if after 20, you get a significant result, then stop because you found what you wanted. Or if it's not significant, then okay, probably you didn't have enough, enough, enough sample size. So you, could, you can scan the next batch of 20 and add some more. And you can keep doing until you, re, you reach your maximum number of 100 rats. But at least if you got a significant result on the way, you won't have to sacrifice so many animals. Well, as I show here, this is completely wrong. You cannot do that. You have to decide in advance how many rats you're going to scan and you got to scan them all. Otherwise, you're going to inflate your p-values. I mean, the alternative to that is that you have to use a much more conservative p-value. You have to correct your p-values for the fact that you might stop in the middle. So that was for this example. Now let's see how we're going in time. Yeah, we have probably time for one more. Um, actually, maybe this one is in more interesting. So um, yeah, so the one I'm gonna skip is the one where uh, you remove outliers. Um, basically, when you run your analysis, you might find after examining your data that you have some outliers and you might decide to remove them. And suddenly this will make your data look better. Um, again, you cannot do that because unless you've decided already prior to your experiment, um, what is the rule to remove outliers? Otherwise, you can always base your decision on what you want to obtain. If your outliers don't show, don't go in the same direction that you want to show, um, they will just, um, you will just remove them. If they still go in the same direction that you want, you'll keep them. It, it gives so much opportunities to, to manipulate the results. But um, the experiment I really wanted to show is this fourth example here about post hoc testing. So usually when you run tests, um, you should decide prior to your experiment which tests you're going to run. Otherwise, um, you risk, again, manipulating your data. And I'm going to show an example again. So uh, again, you know, with my randomized seed of 30, 30, uh, 42, I have two uncorrelated data uh, variables, but uh, just by chance. They are marginally non-significant, but almost significant. And I really wish they were significant so that I could um, publish this data. Of course, this is ridiculous because this is just random noise, right? There, there is no underlying correlation between them. So what can I do? Well, first thing I could maybe, instead of a two-tailed test, I could run a one-tailed test. I'm only, maybe I'm only interested in testing for positive correlations. I expect there to be a positive relationship between X and Y. I'm not interested in the negative correlation and uh, I'm gonna run a one-tailed test. And uh, I get the same plot, but my p-value has been halved. Uh, this is the easiest thing to do. Of course, it's completely wrong. Um, in fact, in 99% of the cases, you should never run a one-tailed test. Uh, first, on, first of all, if you want to run a one-tailed test, you should have decided to do that already prior to looking at your data. And second of all, um, you really need a good reason 
to run a one-tailed test. You need to show, you need to justify why you would be only interested in, in this case, positive correlation and not negative ones. And usually it's never the case. Um, for example, if you develop a new MRI sequence and you want to show that it's better than previous sequences, and then you're gonna say, yeah, I'm only interested in, in showing that my sequence is better. Um, and therefore I'm just going to run a one-tailed test. Well, that's wrong because even though you're not, you hope that your sequence is better, uh, you are still going to be interested whether your sequence is worse, whether it goes in the other direction, because if it's worse, then you know that you should go back to the drawing board and design a new sequence. So it's almost never true that you're only interested in one direction. So, okay, we're not gonna run a one-tailed test. So let me remove this and go back to, again, my previous situation, two-tailed test, marginally non-significance. What else can I do? Well, I can, I can try an alternative test, right? This was a Pearson correlation coefficient, marginally non-significant. Well, how about I run a Spearman correlation instead? What happens? All right, bingo. On the same data, by running a Spearman correlation, I get a p-value of 0.04. I'm happy I get a significant p-value. But then reviewers might say, well, why did you use a Spearman correlation? Usually this is only good for yeah, non-normal data. Okay, no problem. I'm going to try to show whether my data is normal or not. Uh, even though it was you know, because of the way the code is run, uh, the data that was simulated is normal, but you know, this is, this is a p-hacking seminar. So I'm going to show how you can manipulate that too. So let's try it. Let's plot my variables. Okay, this is my histogram. Um, well, of course, because of the small sample size, it doesn't look quite like a Gaussian, but uh, I can run this uh, Shapiro normality test and ah, I get a p-value that's non-significant. So the Shapiro test doesn't tell me that my data is not normal. And it's actually, um, the interesting thing about those tests is it's actually very difficult to test for normality. Um, there is very little power in these normality tests. So you really need very large sample sizes to detect deviations from normality. So actually my normality test doesn't help me in showing that my variable is not normal. Okay, let's try the other variable. Well, yeah, same thing. This actually looks quite like a Gaussian. So my data yeah, is probably normal. So I cannot justify um, why, you, why I would wanna use a Spearman correlation. Okay, well, in the same vein, I can just double down, yeah? I, I'm gonna use p-hacking. If I could use an alternative test to show my correlation, which was the, the Spearman correlation, I can use an alternative test to show normality. So let's make a QQ plot with confidence intervals of my variable X. So if data is normal, my data should be between those confidence bands. And lo and behold, I have an outlier, which is outside of the confidence bands. Therefore, after trying various tests, I finally found one, which shows that my data is not normal. And therefore I can justify why I can use a Spearman correlation instead of a Pearson correlation. And again, to reiterate, yeah, I've managed to make my p-value significant. So again, what's wrong with that? Well, again, because I didn't determine before what tests I'm going to run, I can run so many different tests until I found what I wanted to find. And this is again, this multiple comparison problem. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to go back to my presentation to um, conclude. So adding data will always eventually, it might take a while, but will eventually will give you the result you want because p-values follow a random walk and it's a pro property of random walks that they will visit everything eventually. So you should not stop experiments after partial data collection unless you understand and correct for the effect on p-values. If you've decided to acquire 20 subjects, you should acquire 20 subjects, not more, not less. Um, you can always find good reasons to remove undesired data points, right? So if a, if a data point doesn't agree with your hypothesis, 
you know, you can say, ah, maybe you can check whether this is the subject that moved a lot in the scanner. And if it did, yeah, you have a good reason to remove it. And then suddenly your p-values become significant. Of course, you shouldn't do that. The criteria for data rejection should be defined prior to data collection. Uh, and if you search long enough, well, you can always find a statistical test that gives a desired conclusion. Pearson doesn't work, well, try Spearman. Again, this is of course completely wrong. Data analysis should be defined prior to data collection. And again, you should not make decisions after looking at the data, because when you do that, you have already implicitly made multiple tests. So this is just an example from a paper that's going to remain anonymous, but there's Sorry, examples of this. Pierre, are, we don't see your slides yeah. if you're meaning oh. to be showing us something. Yes, I actually do. Ah, uh, oh, let me share again. I guess it was just the wrong one. Can you see this now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So this is just an example from a um, the literature that you see all the time. You know, this is um, ASL data actually, where they conclude blood flow, uh, cerebral blood flow between, you know, controls and treatment. Then they look at the images um, and then they see, ha ha, the images seem to reveal, you know, darker spots after treatment. Images reveal a cerebral blood flow reduction in piriform cortex. Okay, um, that's interesting. That's an interesting finding. And it seems quite obvious when looking at it. And then they say, okay, this reduction was confirmed to be statistically significant. They ran a t-test, they found a p-value less than 0.05. Well, again, they might think, you might think you don't require a multiple comparison correction there because you've only tested one region, right? There's this piriform cortex. But in fact, you've looked at the whole brain, at, at the whole data before you made the decision to only test piriform cortex. So in fact, you've tested the whole, all of the brain regions implicitly in your head, even if you haven't formally ran a t-test on them. So you should of course correct for that. So you have to distinguish between confirmatory and exploratory studies, right? For confirmatory studies, you want to validate a defined hypothesis. And in this case, it's very clear that everything has to be defined prior to data collection. And yeah, because in this case, yeah. you need a binary Sorry answer. Sorry again, yeah. we aren't advancing with you. Uh, so I'm wondering if you ended up sharing the wrong thing. We're on slide 11. There you go. Okay. Okay. Okay, so um, yeah, the goal of confirmatory studies, you want to validate a, a hypothesis, yes or no. So yeah, you need this sub non-optimal uh, p-value threshold 0.05, but maybe that's the best way to do it. So that's okay. Well, for exploratory studies, well, what you wanna do is identify interesting new hypotheses. So actually, even though you still might still report p-values, uh, as we've seen also in previous talks, the p-values don't mean that much in that case. Statistical significance is not so relevant because in fact, even marginally non-significant results may still warrant further investigation that might correspond to you know, interesting hypotheses. So just be transparent, show your data, report confidence intervals. The goal is not so much to report significance, but just to estimate potentially relevant effects. And that's what you have to keep in mind. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Great. Thank you for an excellent talk. I really appreciated that you concluded with, um, you know, guidelines on how we could be doing this better.